Hey, everybody, this is Chris and Kathy from Petability Podcast. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to Petability Podcast through your favorite streaming app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Petability Podcast and share our content on social media. You can also support the show by making a donation. Simply go to our website at petabilitypodcast.buzzsprout.com and click on the heart symbol at the top of the page. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. It's good to see you. Great to see you as always, Kathy. What do you think you want to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about traction. We're going to talk about getting a grip, so to speak. Yes. How do you like what yes. I did there? Did you see what I did there? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always on my toes with you, Kathy. <laughs> you see what I did there? Yeah, I got okay. it. All I right. think our so, audience is pretty smart too. So they I are pretty probably, clever, yeah. yeah. They probably got um, it too. Um, so let's talk about why it's important for our dogs to have traction in the home. I mean, I, I think that um, maybe people don't really think tremendously about their dog's ability to gain traction in the home, but it really, it really is very important for our dogs to be able to gain traction, not just for walking, um, in the house and and but for gating stairs as well so you want to talk a little bit about why um why it's important to have or the ability to have traction absolutely i i have found over the years that i don't do one single interaction it seems with a patient or a friend or whoever it may be without talking about traction because i feel like it affects every diagnosis and and pet out there to some degree. And just for clarification, I notice when I say, hey, I think your dog needs traction. And sometimes I get a deer in the headlights look because people are like, what, what is she saying? What is traction? So as you said, getting a grip, but preventing slipping and so forth. And I think it goes well beyond safety and, you know, strains and sprains and things like that that could obviously occur if, if your pet slips, like it can happen with us. But I think traction allows for so many other beneficial things that we would like to expound upon today. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, the, the ability to gain traction in, in any situation for these dogs, you know, especially if they're recovering from surgery or if they're senior, it's really about m maximizing safety and preventing those injuries. But also, I'd like to, to touch on this, it's about confidence, too. And, and, and so we go, well, why should we, why should we be concerned with our dog's confidence? Well, we should be concerned with it because it's a quality of life issue. So let's say your dog, you're in the kitchen and your dog wants to be with you in the kitchen, but they're afraid they're going to slip on the floor. And what history has taught them is that gating those floors equals a slipping and falling. And, and even if they don't hurt themselves, they remember that. They remember in their brain that they slip. I mean, if you went outside on your deck every day and you slipped and fell, you wouldn't go out there anymore, right? <laughs> you wouldn't <laughs> right. go out there anymore. So really um, maximizing safety, but also, but building our dog's confidence and their ability to, to get around the home is, is really important as well. So that they can engage themselves in all, you know, family activities, being with their owners. That's what they want to do. They want to be able to be social. They don't want to be isolated. And the, and the fear of falling is very real for them. Definitely. I've had two situations in the past week uh, that speak to the importance of traction. One, I went to a client of mine's home and he has a, an aging greyhound and he lives on the second floor and he has to go up two steep flights of stairs no matter which door he comes in. And so the dog has chosen the, the back stairs. He feels better there. They're wooden. And we simply talked about uh, putting some uh, 3M strips down, those traction strips that are kind of like sandpaper, and uh, seeing if that helps him because he is hesitant. And the owner doesn't know. Did he, did he slip on them once? Is he just feeling more fearful and weaker and not wanting to, you know, go up those steps or down those steps for that matter? So that was one 
little little episode where I talked about the importance of traction and, and so forth. The other is also an elderly uh, little miniature schnauzer that I'd seen and is doing great. So in less than six weeks time, the dog has gained muscle mass and, and is uh, doing his exercises and, and seemingly improving, but the leg in question had not gained muscle mass. It stayed stable, but the owner was questioning, you know, well, this is the weak leg. Why, why is, is Strider not improving muscle mass on this, this leg when he gained two centimeters on the other side? And we think it comes down to confidence, as you were saying, and traction. If he's not willing to engage that weaker leg because he's not confident on it, then he's never going to build strength because how does a dog typically build strength? Through weight bearing. Currently, he's leaning off that leg to the other side. So the good leg is getting stronger and stronger, but the, quote, bad leg is remaining relatively unchanged. So what did we do on Saturday? Put on some toe grips. <gasps> Dr. Busby's toe grips, one of my most favorite. I just want to point out and just quickly that we will be having an exclusive interview with Dr. Busby, the inventor of toe grips, in one of our next segments. So stay tuned for Yay! that. I love Dr. Busby. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think one of the things that happens to these dogs, I think that they, if they fall or they don't feel confident, maybe they feel they don't have the strength to get that, those, the stairs or, or the floors, or I think it psychs them out. I think it really does. It, you know, again, grading, but grading, going back to the statement of, you know, if you fell every time you went outside, you wouldn't go outside. So I think that, that that's a big factor for them. Now, if we can get these dogs to be confident and understand that they are not going to slip and fall, I think that's going to really aid them in their ability to, like you said, in their mobility, their weight bearing, and particularly for your little schnauzer to gain that muscle mass because he's got to use that leg to be able to get that muscle mass. And, you know, when these dogs alter their gait in any way, even if it's a small way, you know, those other muscles that take on that job, they're taking on two jobs now, I guess, really, right? Um, they're, they're susceptible to injury now. You know, we've changed this dog's posture. We've changed this dog's gait. And now what is this dog? Is this dog going to have some compensatory related issue later, a muscle strain or a muscle injury on a dog that now has a good leg, but now has injured that good leg? So I think that the that traction is a, it's a, I think it's a worthy topic. Absolutely. And let me tell you, her hardwood floors, as we have here in New England, were gleaming. And every time Strider stepped off the carpet, onto the hardwood, that right hind leg would just whoop, slide out. We put the toe grips on. It was like a miracle. It was amazing. And the owner was so elated. And toe grips are one great option, but we're going to talk about several different uh, types of things to help your dog to gain traction throughout our podcast today. Do you want to talk a little bit about toe grips first and what they are sure. and how they work? The toe grips are, it's a wonderful invention. I wish I had invented this myself because it's such a simple concept, but it's not something I'd seen before. And I've been a technician for 30 years. So this was really exciting to me to see this a product like this on the market, because like you said, I mean, almost every one of our patients has some issue with traction and then that affects their mobility. So toe grips are just little rubber cylinders that go over the toenails. So just the tips of the toenails, not all the way back, just the little tip of the toenail. And what happens is when the dog is standing, that toe grip makes contact with the, with the floor. Create, and that, that toe grip creates a little, that creates what Dr. Busby calls the grip zone. And that's what prevents the dogs from slipping. That little rubber cylinder makes contact with the ground and prevents the slipping. Now, you know, you'll see dogs, you know, as a veterinary technician, I see dogs coming into the clinic all the time, skating across that floor, trying desperately to grip the, the tile with their toenails, and they just can't because it's tile and it's linoleum, and they can't. And also, I see some patients that are senior or maybe recovering from surgery that just don't have the ability to have their natural mechanism for for gripping and, and, and traction or gaining traction. So maybe dogs that are you know, young, younger and healthier may have that mechanism where they, their paws, you know, grip and, tr and, and grab, but maybe your senior dog doesn't have that ability, or maybe your dog that's recovering from surgery, just that mechanism has failed for them for whatever reason, post-surgery, osteoarthritis, whatever. So um, I, I love this product. I think the other thing is great is that you put them on your dog, you can take your dog anywhere. You can take your dog to the groomer, you can take your dog to the vet, you can take them to wherever, you know, wherever there are floors, Chris, you can go, right? You can go to those floors. 
Um, and you don't have to re, you don't have to worry about putting on the boots or whatever. Just a simple over the toenail um, application. That's it. And then I think they replace them when they just start to wear out. I want to say maybe, I'm going to say depending on how your dog gates, but probably like somewhere between maybe about six weeks, I would guess. But I'd, I'd love your opinion on that. Yeah, I think it, it really varies on the dog in terms of how long they they last. I have had clients who have told me in the past that that they literally wear out and, you know, create a slit in them because they've worn that one spot so much and they need to put on new ones. And other times, you know, they, they last till they go to the groomer the next time. They take them off. They put on a fresh pair of tires, if you will. Right. I know that... Uh, I think that, that Dr. Busby's on their website says to actually remove them, you know, kind of clean things up and, and replace them, uh, which is like changing your tires, right? That idea right. that when you put them back on, they're not going to be in the same place on their toenail, so they get a, a fresh grip zone. I have found, though, with that, that sometimes they will have the tendency to fall off a little bit more easily because they've been removed and put back on, so they're already stretched out. Uh, they are easy to put on. A lot of times, uh, folks wanted me to do the first time because it sounds complicated, and they're like, oh, well, that's not so bad. They come in all different sizes. I think making sure you have the right size is imperative. Um, they're color-coded for size, and I know my dogs are the small or red Dr. Busby's toe grips. And so many times people mistake and they think that they have red painted toenails. Let me assure you, they do not. I do pamper my pooches, but they do not have red painted red toenails. toenails. My dog is the medium blue, but I, I would like to, when Dr. Busby's on our show, I'm going to suggest to her that she come up with some, you know, cool patterns, cow print, pink polka dot, <laughs> you know, because I think it would be cool. You're right. Sometimes they do mistake them for nail for nail polish. It is not nail polish. You're just little rubber cylinders that go over the toenail and they're just color coded for, for the convenience of the owner. And there is a measuring chart on the, the package when you get them so that you're able to measure the dog's toenail itself to make sure that you're getting the appropriate size. Now, Kathy, let me ask you about that measuring chart. Were you able to actually use the dental floss as Dr. Busby suggests and, and measure accurately? Yes, I was. You know, it, it takes a little, I will agree, it did take a little bit of practice to be able to do it on my own because sometimes dogs are squirming and worming and they're, you know, they're excited to be in rehab and excited to see me. Um, I actually, we, we actually in the practice have the benefit of having an extra set of hands there. And so if one person pets and, you know, schmoozes the dog up a little bit and while well, I measured, that's, that's, that, that seems to work well. But yeah, I think with some practice, you can do it by yourself, you know, and the dog gets used to it. And we don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to make we don't have to make this a big deal for our dogs either. We don't have to, uh, you know, wh how we're feeling emotionally about it when we start measuring our dogs or putting these toe grips is actually translated to the dog. So if you're hesitant or scared or worried or they're going to go, wow, there's something to worry about. But if we're, you know, we, if we can change our mindset, get our dogs used to condition them to get the measurements and condition them to get the toe grips on, it's just going to be a natural part of their, their routine. Um, and we can change that emotional response to, to this kind of handling. Well, maybe it was my trepidation and fear, but I had a hard time measuring. So I thought, thought okay, I'm going to bring my dental floss in and we're going to do this. And I actually practiced on my own dog who could care less about things. <laughs> well, I Your couldn't get my easy. marker. I couldn't get my marker to work on the dental floss. So I'm like, ah, it's waxed dental floss. I need to go buy the unwaxed dental floss. So I did that. No, no better. No better. So for me, it was just a matter of trial and error, which I know a lot of listeners don't have the ability uh, to do that. But I think there's only seven sizes. And so you have a pretty good idea, you know, the size of, of your pet and what they may take. Um, also, I think they point out that the front nails oftentimes can be a little bit bigger than the hind nail. So make sure you look look for that because you may need two different sizes, a slightly larger size typically on the front feet and smaller on the back. But for my pooches and most of the ones that I've seen over the years, and I have used this product, trust me, four years since it came out, uh, most of the time, 95% of the time, it's one size for the dog. You know what I, uh, I just realized that we didn't talk about, but we should make sure too when we're using the toe grips that the dog's nails are actually um, the appropriate length. So um, we want to make sure that we've trimmed our dog's nails and are not too long. Otherwise, we're not getting that grip zone 
Um, so, and if you go to her website, you can see what it, what it looks like to make sure that your dog's nails are appropriate, the appropriate length. Now, if you have a dog that has really long toenails, um, that's going to create a couple of problems. One, you're not going to get that grip zone that you get with the toe grip slipping it over because it's just going to be too far forward. It's just not going to make that contact with the ground. But the other thing is if you've got a dog with, with long nails, you know, your dog's going to have to make room for those nails so they're going to rock back on their feet. So already you've altered your dog's gait by having these long toenails. So we want to make sure our dog's dog toenails are the appropriate length to make sure that the toe grips work for, for um, gaining that, that, that grip. Well, and I think that's an important point, period. So the first thing I talk to owners about, and remember I said earlier in our, our session here that uh, there's not an interaction that goes by where I don't talk about traction. And if it's a young, healthy dog, I still talk to the owners about appropriate nail length to provide the best use of their feet and not altering gait and getting the best grip and all that good stuff. We also sometimes forget about the length of the nails will push as you said, push them the back on their feet, but also push the digits, the toes up a little mm -hmm. bit and can change the articulation. There are many, many little joints in the, the feet, in the paws of the pet. And so may lead to earlier arthritic changes and such in those smaller joints um, of the, the feet. Uh, so definitely that. And then the other thing is making sure that their foot fur or hair is adequately trimmed. Because oh, yeah. you could have the toe grips on, and if they have Muppet feet, it's not going <laughs> to matter because those that grip zone is going to be on top of that fur, and they're still going to slip and slide around. So some of these things seem obvious, but you know, if we just keep those nails and and that fur trimmed, then oftentimes that does enough to to start with. If you're kind of on the fence, yeah, oftentimes that will just give them just enough traction to to help them not not slip on those floors. Are there any other products out there that you use? Chris, besides toe grips, is there something else that you that you will you, that you like that you use that your clients use? Well, I'm kind of old, so I know that they're coming out with newer products all the time. But one of the things that I have used over the years is the paws booties, mm. and you know, like you were saying, Kathy, with the toe grips, it's like their traction goes with them wherever. I use the paws booties either with or without the toe grips, but in kind of case specific. Uh, scenarios. So you were talking earlier about going to the, the vet and the dogs come in and they're slipping and sliding on those gleaming polished floors. And so I'll say use paws booties, which are the rubber balloon type of booty for going to the vet for that scenario. Or you're going to Aunt Susie's house and she has those gleaming hardwood floors and you don't want your dog slipping and sliding around, so I use the paws booties for that. So this start, product started as something used for outdoors, namely to prevent the salt and ice from getting between the dog's pads and causing pain. I'm sure a lot of us have experienced that moment when we're out on a walk on a brisk winter day and suddenly your dog comes up lame and they're, they're lifting their foot and they you know chewing at their foot and it's like, oh my God, what happened? Because you didn't see anything. And it's a little piece of salt or an ice shard or something that, that poked up in there and it's like, it oh my hurts. God, it yes, hurts. it's the worst. <laughs> so um, that's kind of how they started. And as with a lot of things in canine rehabilitation, we have borrowed these products and turned them into rehabilitation products. Right. And so I will use them outdoors for various scenarios, but I also use them indoors and you can cut slits in them so that they are breathable. Because I think one of the things that we need to remind our listeners about is that the dogs sweat between their toes. And that's the only place they sweat. And so these are a rubberized latex type product and it, you can't leave them on 24 seven. It's like leaving a child unattended with a balloon. They could pull them off, they could you know, chew on them. But also you don't want to get something funky, yeasty, that sort of thing. So I tell people to put some powder in there, um, which absorbs moisture. You can do that with any booty. Um, Gold Bond works well. And uh, cut some slits in them. And those are the indoor booties. And they don't tend to tear anymore. Nice. You know what else I liked for powder? <clears throat> I know you're going to laugh at this, but this is a real product. It's called Anti-Monkey Butt Powder. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Love I've not it. used it, but I've heard about it. Oh, I love it. Uh, I love it. And, it, and it, it actually smells really good, too. And for some reason, they have Lady Anti-Monkey Butt, which is pink, <laughs> but I don't, know if the, I don't know if the formula is different. But it works really well for that, you know, getting that moisture, you know, between the, the toes. So I, I like that product as well. Have you ever used um, 
paw friction. I haven't had an opportunity to try paw friction yet. I've had clients tell me that they've, they've been pleased with it, but I haven't used it. Are you familiar with that? Absolutely. That is probably the third product that, that I used a lot at, at my business. Um, with any of these, there are pros and cons. So some of the cons that I experienced with the toe grips were if it was a dog that tended to turn its foot over and knuckle where they drag or um, create friction in the opposite direction, that'll pull those those toe grips off. And if we had a lot of trouble keeping them on, then we might try the paw friction. So the paw friction is blue rubberized granules that are medical grade. So to maximize the benefit of the paw friction, it's best to do adequate preparation. And they give you all these instructions on the product and it's fairly simple. But one of the things I think our listeners need to realize is that when a dog ages, their pads of their feet become less rubbery and more leather-like. So I compare it to, you know, when, when they're born, it's like they're born with tennis shoes, they have good grip, and by the time they're senior dogs, it's using that worn out leather penny loafer. And it is really slippery on the bottom. So one of the things that they suggest is taking a file, like a nail file, and gently rubbing it across the pads of your dog's feet and kind of roughening up that surface. And so, yes, it does maybe make it a little bit more uh, roughened, but also allows more places of purchase for those granules to stick. And this will become evident uh, why that's important a little bit later in this conversation. So the other thing then that I do is make sure I take rubbing alcohol and clean the pads really well, just like you'd want anything to adhere the best. I you do that with Dr. D Busby's toe grips too. I always clean their toenails with rubbing alcohol in addition to soaking the toe grips in the alcohol per their instructions. So I do a little nail filing. It doesn't hurt them. Sometimes people are like, oh my God, you're going to file their pads. I'm saying, think what they're walking on on a daily basis. Yeah, and we're not being, you know, <laughs> we're, exactly. And yeah. they're filing it themselves. And you get, yeah, just to clarify, it's not an aggressive. Um, no. We're just doing a very just, gentle. Just a very yeah. gentle. And then you clean them with the rubbing alcohol, which also does not sting because you've just done that gently. And then you put a very thin layer of glue that they provide. Again, medical grade. If they lick it or what have you, it will not hurt them. It's not toxic. And a thin layer is important because if you put too much glue on, it'll glob up too many of the blue rubber granules and it'll be too thick and chunky. So it's more likely to just flake off. So after you put the glue on, then you press the dog's paw into the tray with the rubberized granules and those blue granules then stick to the glue. And so you want to make sure that you're covering all just the weight bearing surfaces. You don't have to get crazy with the glue, just the bottom of the pads. And if you have put the paw in the, the blue granules adequately, then all of the glue is going to be covered by the blue granules. So you don't have to worry about glue getting on your floor, or your carpet or anything like that. And they do suggest waiting a certain period of time, but it doesn't take long, you know, a few minutes and they're good to go. Uh, Chris, are you doing all four feet with the paw traction? And do you do, are you doing two, alter, you know, alternating? Are you doing all four for these dogs? Or I think for any product on the feet, you always want to do the right and left. Most of the companies will recommend doing all four feet, but many times I have cheated and just done the hind feet because their front feet are fine. So more times than not, I find that there are problems with the hind feet, the rear feet, and I will only put it on those two feet. Especially, it depends on, you know, one, the physical issues, but two, the, the temperament and tolerance, you know, the dog. So I prioritize that way. Have you seen the foam squares that they sell at like Home Depot and uh, Lowe's? I have some clients who use these thick foam squares. The ones that I, puzzle together? Yes. I can only imagine that, they're, yeah, that their house looks like an agility ring probably. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, when I think about it, I think, well, maybe, yeah, this only provides some traction. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a menagerie of squares in your house and maybe that doesn't match your decor. But I'm wondering if that is an effective effective way to help these dogs gain some traction, even if it's not the whole floor, but maybe just we use those foam squares to leave the things that are important, like the food bowl, the back door, the, you know, the kennel, the water bowl, 
What do you think about the foam, the foam squares, the agility foam squares or the mats that they use in agility? Sure, sure. Well, I think that certainly anything on the floor that we can provide actually trumps anything that we can put on the dog. So leaving them in their natural state as long as possible, I think is ideal, but sometimes you need to, you know, start somewhere and then add more and more layers in uh, as time goes on or depending on what their condition is. So those foam squares definitely uh, used over time. You'll see that they're actually kind of gouged with the mm -hmm. dog's nails and so forth. So they are able because they're softer and they are, are able to, to grip in there. I've even had people for small dogs use like the shelf liners or the pads that go under rugs because they are, tend to be tacky and stick to the floor, whatever surface that they're on, um, and then also give the, the dogs that traction. Uh, again, if it was a really big dog, I think they would tend to tear it up or, or displace it. So you have to kind of think about that, what matches your pet. Yeah, and then the the mentioning of the the shelf lining or the the other product, I think it's called Scoot Guard, and you put it underneath your rug runners to make sure that your rug runners don't slip. That's important to remember because if you're going to put down rug runners, the rugs need to not be. You have to have the rugs not be able to to slip. So I have a client who has rug runners for one of her elderly dogs and a, and a young dog, and the old dog will use the rug runners for traction to get to the back door, and the other one uses it as a magic carpet by running and sliding <laughs> on it. So <laughs> and I do want to make sure that we hold that down either with some kind of scoot guard or something to it to, I don't know if you want to use Velcro strips or not for, for rug runners, but something that's going to hold that rug right in place so that it's not really um, sliding around when the dogs who really need it to gain traction are slipping on the rug that we provided them so they won't slip. So remember to put something underneath those rugs like the scoot guard so that they can, so that the rug itself doesn't slip. Absolutely. And I do think that people, you know, it depends on if it's going to be an uh, ongoing thing, you know, something that's happening with a disabled pet or, or a, an aging pet, or if it's a temporary thing post-surgery. Many times I've advised people to go to the back of the big box stores where they have very low profile carpets that are rubber backed on those rolls and the, you know, like at a Lowe's or a Home Depot or what have you, and they have both runners and wider rug sections. So if you know that, you know, it's going to be something maybe a little bit more long term, but you don't want to spend an arm and a leg, those are great because they already have the rubber backing and they're low profile and you can cut them to the length that you want. You can cut them up and place them where you'd like them to be, which brings me to another great product that I often recommend is just yoga mats. Oh yeah, the yoga mat. I can't believe I didn't think of that. The yoga mats really is a good product. I'll use that in, in our practice when I have patients that are really concerned. I have some patients that like to have their yoga mats rolled out for them when they get there because they're afraid they're going to, you know, they're going to slip on the floor, even though our floor is pretty, you know, good about traction, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll roll it out for them, you know, like a red carpet. I'll roll it right out um, because it gives them confidence. You know, they're not going to slip when they're running, when they're walking, you know, or gating that, um, the yoga mats, actually a cat that we work with too, that had a spinal cord injury. Same thing for him. You know, he, he needs to have that traction, his little tiny little toe beans, his little cute little cat paws, they slip at the back because he doesn't really have good control over that. Um, and so I'll roll the yoga mat out for the cat as well. Yes. And seeing people in their homes with their pets, you know, oftentimes they do have lovely rugs in the middle of the rooms and so on and so forth. And then they're kind of stuck because they'll say, you know, Fluffy will just stand at the edge of the rug and he won't move beyond it. And yet they don't want to invest in all these runners, which can be expensive and, you know, do you get enough to match and so forth. So I'll say, just go online or go to your neighborhood yoga studio because they always have yoga mats that people leave behind. I don't know how you can leave a practice without leaving with your yoga mat, but I guess it happens and they never go back and retrieve it. So um, at my former business, we definitely would, there was a yoga studio around the corner and we'd periodically get their cache of, of yoga mats. Plus they change over. So they have the mats that they provide for their, their clientele and then they get new ones after a few months. So anyway, I'd always grab those. They are washable, which a lot of people don't know. So you can mm. wash them. They wash up really nicely and you can cut them to size. So I've used them as stair treads. I've used them, you know, I was referencing earlier from area rug to area rug. So you're creating that path around your, your home for your pet to follow. And they will gravitate to it more times than not. 
you also mentioned earlier, Kathy, about kind of some key places to put traction. And I think we both agreed that in front of their food and water bowls. Right. You know, we want them to engage their muscles there, not start splaying out, nothing to be a deterrent to eat the nutrition that they need to stay healthy and so forth. I often say points of transition, and that's another thing where people look at me like deer in the headlights, like, what do you mean? <laughs> well, and we kind of do this naturally, coming in the door, at the bottom of the steps, uh, at the top of the steps, over thresholds, things like that, getting in and out of their dog bed, getting in and out of their crate. So you're going from one surface potentially to another, wh whether it's a different height or a different texture, you know, coming off of the linoleum and onto the hardwood, and you might want to put a rug there as a transition point. I think that's a really good point to have them in places that are, are transitional, but also these landmarks for them, you know, where they know that they can get traction. So they know when they get to their food and water bowl, they know that they're not going to slip and splay. Splay. Splaying is actually a fear. It can be a fearful, frightening thing. Um, and, and it actually, I've had a fair amount of patients get injured with their splaying, you know, muscle pull, uh, strain, sprain, just from the splaying itself. So even these minor, what you might consider minor, muscle strains or pulls can lead to spasms and pain for our dogs and they remember that now um i know this it, is the, the, i want to just interrupt here what, what does splaying mean i know i when they I mentioned when they, it and you mentioned oh it oh god when they when their legs just slip outward you know yeah, like doing the splits right like doing the splits like doing the splits yeah and it hurts yeah. have you ever done the splits on the ice oh my god <laughs> not and intentionally but that's our hurts. point <laughs> and it hurts right it hurts and you could get injured um, so thank you for clearing the find that. Yes. And, and a lot of geriatric dogs, you'll see the dogs that are senior oftentimes will splay and it's, and it's frightening and it, and it can be painful. And so dogs gonna, with neurological conditions. Oh goodness. Yes. Right. That they, they don't, they don't know exactly where their feet are in placement, you know, and then they, and then they slip and fall or splay. You right. Know, their center of gravity that. just gets off a little bit and that legs slips out, slides forward. It's like that instant hamstring stretch. Right. Can you imagine what your brain has to go through when it's just split seconds of, of processing information to have four legs? Like I can barely get up the stairs with my two, right? <laughs> and then, you know, you know, and yet our dogs perform these, these feats of athleticism on a daily basis. Stairs, slippery floors, you know, four legs. <laughs> so it's quite a feat of athleticism if you think about it. Um, what do you think about... Um, what do you think about socks? I know sometimes some of my clients used to use socks. I'm not a huge fan of using socks. I feel like they're a little slippery, but I know that there are some products out there on the market that have some traction on the bottom. Right. I definitely actually recommend not using regular socks because we were talking earlier about how the rug can slide. Well, that's basically when you're, think about yourself walking on hardwood floors in your socks versus your shoes. I slip and slide all over the place. I'm better off in my bare feet. So it's like you're putting that layer of really slippery stuff. But to your point, there are now sock products out there that have, it's basically Plastidip. I don't know if any of you have heard of Plastidip, but you can get it at your hardware store. It's spray on, or you can literally dip into it. And so they're taking a sock and they're putting a rubber coating on the foot portion of it. So it's not just the cotton or the wool or what have you on the floor, but it's that rubber that's that's contacting the floor. Now the issue with socks I find is keeping them up. They so <laughs> they yeah. So again if your dog's dragging or what have you, they'll they'll tend to, you know, just pull down, even if they're not, you know, you don't want to have something so tight that it acts as a tourniquet in order to keep it up. And socks tend to stretch out. So some of the products that I've seen online also have an extra band, like a, a Velcro fastening loop or something like that at the top of the sock to keep it on. Because most of the time the dog's foot is wider than their ankle. And if you can get some sort of, of uh, broad, you know, again, you don't want to make it too narrow that it cuts into them, you know, certainly don't do any home monkeying with socks, like putting rubber bands on your dogs. Uh, no, ankle. goodness, no, we don't want to do that. No, no. no. Um, but they're, they are coming out again with more and greater products. And one I actually saw was on handicapped pets. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. Yeah. So they literally called them traction socks. And what was that? That website's what? Handicapped handicappedpets.com. Okay. 
Great. And I think uh, we're also going to be interviewing Mark, who is the owner of Handicap Pets down the line, but they're constantly coming out with new and better products. And uh, so that's a great website for our listeners to go to and see what they have there. But uh, the traction socks are basically what I described. So again, socks of different sizes to go on your dog's feet, rubberized at the foot portion so they have that traction, and then a fastener that goes up a little bit higher on their leg to keep them up. I've not used them personally, so I don't know how successful they are, but again, it's another option. And they'd be a little bit more breathable than the paws because they have that cotton portion. Nice. I, I think we, you know, I think that it's exciting that we have so many great options now for the, for our dogs now. And I think when we, when we both started doing rehab, we didn't have a lot uh, to work with here as far as, you know, availability for products to um, really help them with traction, except for, you know, our rug runners and so forth. But so it's really exciting to see that people are always inventing or coming up with new and better ways to help our dogs, um, you know, with, with gaining traction. So I think we covered just about everything we had. <laughs> Everything we know about, at least. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And w just one thing I wanted to mention, too, is the topic of this podcast is about traction. And we talked a little bit about safety and increasing confidence and, and thus the, the use of their limbs to keep them stronger and, and engaged and so forth. But also there are this, there is this component of protection. So oftentimes if our dogs are dragging their feet uh, because they're weakened or as you mentioned with the neurological dogs they don't know where their feet are in space and and they may you know wear their nails or or get bloodied knuckles if you will and so forth so that's one component of whatever footwear you put on them as well um, to think about the protection factors and um, you know so anything that you put on their feet you just don't want to make it so cumbersome that they lose even more feedback from the ground. You know, I think that's one of the, the reasons why I really like the toe grips, why I really like the paws booties. You know, how many times, Kathy, have, have you had clients that have said like, oh, I've tried boots on my dog. Oh, they won't wear shoes. Oh my God, you should see them. They spaz out, they're dancing all, you know. <laughs> and I think there's a couple I've things. Heard it. <laughs> so there's, there's one, you know, what, what you do with your dog when they're younger and able is very different than what happens when they need it. It's almost like when they're older, if they've had an injury, they are senior, it's like they instantly feel the benefits of having that product on their feet, you know, to help right. them. Right. Um, and they don't rebel against it like they may have in their younger years. But also you don't want to put, you know, something that's very non-conforming, thick, heavy. It actually may be worse, right? Especially if they're right. weak and they have this big clunky, you know, thing on their foot. I tell people it's, it's like us, you know, going from barefooted to a ski boot or something. Right. That was <laughs> feel very, very awkward and heavy and impossible to move. Right. Right. And so it has to be appropriate. It has to fit appropriate. It has to be able to move appropriately. You know, and the thing that you, we think about, I think about a lot when I'm thinking about the feet or, or the dog's foot. And yes, I do think about the dog's foot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am. More than we should. Rehabs, we, more than we should. But, um, you know, dogs and people, I mean, we have receptors throughout our body and around our bodies. And for dogs, just like people, those receptors happen everywhere in their body. And they're very, they're very, they get a lot of information via touch um, from their body, but also particularly from their feet. So, and those receptors send information to the brain about their environment and about their foot placement. So, you know, when we, we cover our dog's feet, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, you're right, we're not are we interrupting those signals? Is it too heavy? Is it too cumbersome? Um, and sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes we've got to put something on there because our dogs drag. We need to protect them because they don't want to get abrasions on their feet and so forth. But yeah, it's got to be, it's got to conform. It's got to be comfortable and it, it can't be too, too tight or constricting as well. Yes. Yes. I'm all about the malleable foot products because I do think that to your point, they do get a ton of feedback from the ground and you want their foot to still be able to conform to that surface as well, which will contribute to their balance and things too. You know, putting something rigid or, or what have you would, would actually be a, a detriment to some Agreed. of those Agreed. problems that they're already dealing with. So, All right. Sounds like we're going to have a lot of good questions for Dr. Busby when she's on our show. We've got a, <laughs> a lot of great questions for Dr. Busby. So I want you all to tune in. We'll let everybody know when Dr. Busby is going to be on our show. You do not want to miss this. It's a great product. Dr. Busby's going to have a lot of great stuff to talk about as far as traction, and confidence, and maximizing safety. So stay tuned for that one, okay? Sounds good. And I hope that you all are going to think about your dog's feet as much as Kathy and I do. 
I do. I love and I do think about your dad. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to enableyourpet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.